Hey guys, it's Warner with the Red to Black podcast. And today we have special guest, Michelle Markey. She's got her own YouTube channel. Just went above a thousand subs, so that's awesome. Congratulations to her. And today we're going to talk about three different things. We're going to talk about how she got started as an investor, how she started building her channel, which is focused on Warren Buffett style investing, Charlie Munger, you know, two of the greats. Benjamin Graham will probably pop in there. Number two, what her channel is about, how it can support you. And then in the future, what's her investment outlook in these really overinflated markets? So Michelle, let's get started. What about, what about you? How did you get started in this whole deal? Well, thank you so much for having me on, Werner. And how I got started was when I was a teenager and I was lucky to have an older cousin and my uncle who taught me all about investing. And they said that as soon as I turned 18, I should open up my Roth IRA. So I did exactly that. And even though I didn't have a lot of money just working in retail in high school, I just collected some cash and started putting it into my Roth IRA back then. So ever since, I've been trying to do my best to invest and to, as much as possible, continue growing my investments and not lose money because that's the biggest thing I've learned about investing from Warren Buffett is rule number one, never lose money. And rule number two, remember rule number one. So I try to keep that always in mind of how can I be making the best investment decisions that can help me with whatever goals I have in life, whether it's to save up for a house or save up for creating a business or just to save up for retirement so I can be financially free and not have to worry about working until I'm 65 or 70 because I would prefer to not have to do that if I can help it. If I can be, you know, not necessarily smart enough, but be more wise to be able to make the right decision so that I can set myself up for a better financial future. So that's what my channel is all about on YouTube is to try to share my journey in learning how to invest the best way possible. Like you mentioned, the greatest of all time, goats, Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett. And by trying to learn their lessons and try to implement whatever wisdom they've shared with the world, I'm just trying to help all of us be more educated about how we invest. So right now, nowadays, it it makes me really reflect truly about where we are in the markets. And, and I see a lot of parallels to where we were in the dot-com bubble. And there's so much that I could talk about and say about all of that. Like I've had a few epiphanies lately, especially with buybacks and corporate debt. So I'd love to talk with you about some of those things too. And I'm just excited for being able to be in a position where this is the best time for all of us to learn how we can invest and try to hone our skills with investing because it's one thing to just go out and buy a stock, but that's not necessarily, quote, the way you should be investing. Like that's that's kind of like buying before you've done your research. And, and even though some people have done like buying of houses in a week, sight unseen, and even though that's become a little bit more normal during the, these tougher times in 2020 or 2021, I think before that, historically, people would spend months researching houses and, and kind of really carefully understanding what they're getting into before they buy a house. So I kind of think we should think the same way before we get into buying any stock is to do our homework, research a company, read their balance sheets, cash flow statement, income statement, and really understand what it is about the company that we believe in and that we think is is going to have a great future and that we can believe their management because we think they have integrity and talent and most of all like we actually like the company and we want it to exist in the world because it, we think it does great things for society so that's what i think investing should be about is that you put your money into things that resonate with your values and that you want to see contribute to the world in a positive way so that's what i'm all about and i hope my whatever I've learned throughout my uh, journey of investing can help others too. Yeah. So those are three, I heard three great points you said. Number one is time and you got on it early. I remember at a young age, I didn't necessarily have the same mentorship that you had in terms of investing, someone really breaking it down for me, but I was awake. I was aware of it, but I didn't quite know how to do it. I didn't really learn it really well to my 35, to about 35, 37. And this book called The Psychology of Money, this, the author talks about one of the greatest assets that people don't realize about Warren Buffett is time. He didn't really start compounding his wealth to his 60s. I mean, he's still wow. wealthy, but 
he's saying that book that he still really didn't start compounding as well to his 60s, but he had on his side times, which what you have been really advantageous for you. It sounds like you started that time clock and in investing really early. And then number two, you for what you talked about was having great mentors. So looking at the people that are really the best in terms of value investing, which is Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, their uh, teacher, Benjamin Graham, or Warren Buffett's teacher, Benjamin Graham. And then number three is you talked about, and I, it's funny you mentioned this because I was on TikTok the other day because I'm just starting a TikTok channel. And I went, it came across this profile and the gal said, oh, this is how you start investing. You open up a bro brokerage account and then you go from there. And I'm like, no, 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 you don't, you don't. It's what Michelle said. You don't open up a brokerage account. You don't even start there. Where you start is like Michelle was saying is you look at the management, look at durable competitive advantage. You look at the cash flow, three accounting statements, and you, you do your due diligence. You do the hard work or the necessary work. It may not be hard if you love it. You just do the work mm -hmm. to, to create or to figure out which businesses you're looking at buying. And then, yeah. And then the other things you talked about were let's, yeah, let's discuss the, the epiphanies you've had. And I guess we can kind of roll into that. What are some of the epiphanies you've had on your channel and talk to us a little bit more about your channel? All right. Well, uh, and it's been a lot of learning for me. Like, you know, I, I used to think reading some books and listening to podcasts and where I had gotten up to so far, I thought I knew a good deal about investing, but I'm still learning. Like I'm, I'm nowhere near as wise as I would like to be. And, and that's what I really try to hone in on because you could easily look like a stock market genius right now. Like almost anyone could have thrown a dart or taken a monkey and bought stocks and a lot of things and generally done well. Like you'd actually have to go out of your way to lose money in the stock market right now, the way things have been doing over the past few years. So one of the epiphanies that I realized was that I, and I actually did a video about this recently are what I came across as some of the major signs of why we're looking like we're hitting an everything bubble and why this everything bubble could be ready to burst at any moment because we have some of the same same signs that we had like during the Great Recession or 2007, 2008, as well as during the Great Depression of 1929 into 1930. And the, some of those same signs were really eye-opening to me because I used to think like, oh, interest rates, when they go up, then that will be bad for stocks. But we have to go much beneath the surface to really understand what's really going on because it's it's not just a lot of times we we get distracted, I think, by what's talked about in news and, and we focus on what the Fed is doing and we focus on retail and institutional investors. But what maybe isn't talked about enough is the magnitude of of insider selling and also corporate debt and stock buybacks. And also we have the highest levels of income inequality we have ever had, like even more than during 2000 and 1929. And those are some of my epiphanies. And like, I'm happy to go more into some of these areas because they're really kind of a big deal and why I, I feel like I finally realized this is why stocks continue to remain void. Like they're it's it's not necessarily, I mean, to some extent, it is retail inflows and institutional inflows, but there's way more, and I, I need to actually do more research on this myself, but I actually think buybacks have been a powerful proponent of keeping markets up, and they can be good or bad. I'm not necessarily trying to say that, you know, like I know there's some controversy with buybacks right now, and I'm not necessarily saying they're a bad thing, but they can be not great. If you're buying your stock back at valuations that are way above intrinsic value. So like maybe Warren Buffett, if he's buying back his stock, maybe he believes that he's buying Berkshire Hathaway back at below intrinsic value, even though interestingly, Berkshire Hathaway is also at its all time market price highs. And so I find that kind of curious that he, he still seems to think it's below value, but that might not be the case with a lot of other companies. So I just want to pause there for a second because I know I said a lot. I want to key into one thing you said, and it's all caused by debt. And mm. what the media wants you to see is like they're flashing. Hey, just keep investing. Just keep going. Everything's great. I'll, I'll, I'll 
I'll throw him under the bus, Jim Cramer. Guys, do not listen <laughs> to that guy. He's going this way. He's going that way. He's going up. The reason why I talk about that individual is because, like Michelle pointed to in the past, you always want to focus on the fundamentals. Don't ever let anyone else, including myself or Michelle, we're just giving you, you know, not the financial advice. We're just giving you our recommendations that we use, but it's not design. We're not financial advisors, any of that stuff, right? Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, you want to build your skill set, your tool base up so you can make your own informed decisions. And the media will will get you focused on fear. They'll get you focused on all these other things. But the big elephant in the room that you point to is debt. And what you were saying, basically, in terms of buying back stocks, see, the whole idea to buy back stocks, and guys don't realize this, if you go look at the cash flow statement of, say, Oracle, you can do really great things with cash in terms of if you go to the cash flow from investing. I know some of you guys might be going to sleep right now, but it's important to understand these statements. You go look at cash flow from investing, cash flow from financing, you'll see they're do- really good companies like Oracle are doing a few certain things. They're investing in new companies. They're doing capital expenditures on their own, own um, equipment or gear or whatever it is. They are buying back their shares. And then what's the other one? I missed one. Oh, they're paying dividends. Mm-hmm. Now, all these things are very important functions of the company, but here's the caveat that Michelle was pointing to is they're using debt to do it. You got to start really going, mm. it's if they're and, using their cash yeah. flows to do it, then right on guys. But if like Oracle and all these companies, they can get caught. See, this is the challenge we're in this current environment mm-hmm. is they've lowered interest rates to a reckless level. We're now even big companies are, are taking on debt right now. And it's like, okay, we're going to see how this is going to end. Okay. You can pay it down, but is it really like Michelle is saying, is it the, really the smart move? I would say maybe for some companies it is if they really got under control, but for other companies, they're just going to, they're actually going to get smoke check when the debt and equity markets close down or they the prices get too high to finance your business that should have been financed off of cash flow. Right. And, 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 yeah, and what's, what's really concerning about some of that is like, sure, while debt is cheap and your interest payments are low on the cheap debt that you use to buy back stock, like for now, it's all well and dandy, but until like the interest payments go really high, that, that might be challenging. And then in addition, if you have lowered your cash reserves because you kind of burned it buying back your stock, you might end up being weaker later on when there's an actual economic downturn and you're trying to stay afloat, but you've depleted your cash that, and you know, like there's only so much credit you can have gotten. And if you don't have enough access to credit or cash, you could be SOL and, and kind of be, you know, left for the wayside if you're, you know, not in a great financial position later on. So that's, that's part of the perfect storm that, that some of this is leading to is, is that you, you know, when times were good, that's when like a lot of people use debt to do all kinds of things. And, and right now, like they, they even haven't put enough of their cash flows into growing the companies, like instead of investing it, putting it into growing the workforce or into research and development and, and things that will be, you know, not generating immediate income or revenue, but they should be down the line eventually, as long as you're investing, right. They're not doing that and instead buying back shares, which doesn't necessarily lead to new revenues, like buying back only takes shares out of out of circulation. And, and then that artificially makes it seem like earnings are higher. So you think everything's great, like er, like so much news articles are saying earnings are high, like earnings growth is projected to be nine percent. But how much of that earnings growth is attributed to buybacks? Because then that sort of just manipulating it a little bit it's not a true reflection of how much a company grew in as far as like economic value like contributing to society in an economic way giving more jobs producing products that people bought and you know the the circle of economics so it just seems like you know that's something that i'm curious to see when the buyback game will kind of be paired back a little bit because that and and then in addition the corporate you know, bonds that have been issued to afford those buybacks. Because to me, that's the big, big question is whatever will scare the markets enough to do a lot less buybacks. Cause we've hit a record. Like the last time we had a record was in 2018 and we finished that year in the negative. 
And, and now we have had a record amount of buybacks in 2021 with $850 billion of buybacks. And I mean, you know, some of the companies like it's, it, it makes all the sense now because I, I've been kind of scratching my head. What is causing markets to, to really like keep going up? Like who is putting, who is really fueling the markets up? And, you know, with all the cheap money that's available, companies taking on debt and then they buy back stock. And now it makes a lot more sense. And that, that I think is like, I don't know, one of the biggest epiphanies I've had recently. Yeah, that's a, I mean, multiple things you said there that are really important. The things that I keyed into, which I'm also tracking is it all goes back to debt and, and it creates this environment, this cognitive disconnect between performance, as you talked about. And to give you an example, like I recently went and bought a truck in Gillette, Wyoming. I pay cash for it. I've never done that before. Like to show mm. the dealership, new truck, pay cash because used trucks were trading. It was a diesel truck. Used diesel trucks were trading at the same price as new trucks. If you've ever been in Wyoming or oil town, people beat the living crap out of their diesel trucks. And I'm like, nah, I'm going to get this thing new because I don't know what these guys are. They're towing massive amounts with them. They're beating them up and down rough, jankety roads. And I go into the dealership and I pay for this truck. And they ask me, I pay cash. They ask me, hey, do you want the insurance policy on it, right? It's about twenty five hundred dollars more, and I'm and I'm since I'm paying cash, I'm making different decisions in my head than if I was paying for that truck financing. Because if I was mm. financing that twenty five, and this is where the cognitive disconnect comes in, that twenty five hundred dollars becomes like twenty bucks a month. So you think that twenty five hundred dollars you're getting is only twenty five dollars a month, and when that you do that type of that this free money for long enough, people forget, like you were saying. They don't bake in their margin of safety. So what they do mm -hmm. is they swap out cash flow for lines of credit. And lines of credit start becoming the important – that's where the cognitive disconnect begins. They start thinking lines of credit is how they get their cash. It's like, no, 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 no. You get your cash from paying customers and your profit margins depending on the quality of your business. Mm -hmm. But what you're talking about is they flip-flopped it. So now the businesses, they're the ones that are kind of like on a – ton of debt, if their prices tank or their demand tanks, the lines of credit dry up and then they can't service their debt or capital expenditures. And you'd have to do in-depth analysis in each company and figure out what that break-even point is. It's, it's a good amount of work to do that. Mm. But that's what you're talking about, Michelle. You're talking about this cognitive disconnect. Margin of safety is not, people aren't thinking in terms of straight up cash. They're not stress testing their businesses. I'm not saying the really smart ones are, but they're getting caught in this free credit environment and it's usurping mm -hmm. the cash flow and it's creating a cognitive disconnect where people go, oh, this is cheap. But when it all blows, it's then you, like Warren Buffett says, you see who's wearing their shorts. You see who's mm -hmm. actually prepared for it. And that's where what Michelle and I are talking about. That's where if you stack cash and you're ready to go in, you can get exceptionally good deals. On, yeah. on anything, whether you're investing, mm -hmm. buying a business, or even buying equipment to start a new business. You can just right. go buy equipment from these businesses that bond out mm -hmm. at 80%. And now you can start a business with not much, no debt, no nothing. Right. And it's like, uh, to your point, I mean, why pay, um, in, in your uh, example, with used car prices being as expensive as they've ever been, it makes more sense to have bought your brand new truck at retail prices, but usually it shouldn't be like that. Usually, you know, you, the way I think about it with investing in stocks a little bit is I don't want to pay full retail price for the equivalent brand new car. I, I would rather buy it at used prices. So that's my margin of safety is like, I'm not paying the hundred percent full retail MSRP price. I'm waiting until it's 40, 50, 60% off. And that's what I'm going for is like, you know, like the, the car I'm driving now, if I had bought that brand new when it first came out at $30,000, like that's a lot of money, you know, to a lot of people. But I bought that car pre-owned certified and it was a good car. Like whoever the previous owners took really care, good care of it. And I only paid $10,000 for that car. So oh, to me, awesome. I did super well buying that, you know, in my opinion, on sale because it's a great quality car and it still has a lot of life on it to go. So that's how I would hope a lot more people think about it in terms of the stock market is like you want to buy great companies on sale, just like you would buy a good quality 
a car, usually like, you know, a used car, you would ideally buy a good quality one, not one that's been beat up by a lot of people. And, you know, kind of, you want to check that it's still running well, has a lot of life to go. And I feel like there's a similar analogy with companies as you want to try to ideally buy them on sale, not at full retail prices. Yeah, exactly. And, and the reason just for, for the viewers of, of both of our channels, the reason why I bought it at, at full price is because it was part of my plan B operations, which I talked mm-hmm. about on my channel. So if you have like, if you see like a storm coming, you're like, well, I'm going to buy this asset and I'm going to pay market price for that. That's a potential situation where you can, you know, it's like a backup plan, like gold or an asset, a car, land. And you're like, okay, I see things getting crazy and I have this cash in this insanely inflated market. You can take a little off the table and pay a market price for it. But what Michelle's talking about is high quality businesses or anything in the future. Yeah, you normally want to buy at, at like, like this, this, this purchase I do is such a small amount of my money. But mm-hmm. if it's what I'm saying is, is the majority of your money, which Michelle's point to, you want to do what she's saying, which is buy when everyone's freaking out mm-hmm. and buy great quality assets. That's, that's the key to growing your wealth is taking the majority of your wealth. So I would say like 5% you speculate with, or you buy you buy like or ten percent. You buy assets like gold or whatever it is you're storing up to take off the system. But then the other ninety percent. This is just my opinion. Ninety percent. You do exactly what Michelle's saying, and you buy it when it's way depressed, because you'll you'll jump you'll jumpstart all these fools that are making money in the crypto market as they're descending down. You're coming in, and then you're they're taking they're taking ninety percent hit. But to ride back up, you're going a thousand percent. That's what people don't realize. You're going a thousand percent to get back up. Mm-hmm. And you're getting if it's a dividend paying company, and you're getting these cash flows at. See what people don't realize: you want to buy for cash flow. So when you buy at the bottom, you're getting cash flows locked in at phenomenal pricing. Right now, you buy at the top, you're getting one point five percent, two point percent, depending on what you buy. Mm-hmm. You can get higher dividend paying stocks like eight percent, but go look at their financial sheet; they're financing that with debt. Well, and, and some of the, the few things that I, I actually just did a video and um, I'll, I'll put it out soon, but um, that, that kind of video, I looked into what kinds of assets seem to be giving decent amounts of interest or dividends. And even though you might be able to get some higher levels with REITs, like real estate investment trusts, I'd be really careful because I've never invested in those. I'm it's not in my circle of competence, so I don't know enough to to judge if they are good deals or not, but equity REITs can give you like 5% and mortgage REITs can give you 10%, but watch out when interest rates go up and if you know if people start really like doing mass exodus out of real estate, I would be you know kind of watching out what happens with REITs because they've had some good years recently, but for how much longer can the good times keep rolling? So you got to ask, how realistic is it for something to keep putting out the kind of cash flow that it has been? And if it will continue being able to do that, even during tough times, like, is it a recession proof kind of business? So that's the kind of question that a lot of people got to ask themselves about any anything that they invest in. Yeah. And Reese is a great example they're able to pay more right now because here's the thing with real estate. I've been doing real estate for 10 years now. And my dad's been in real estate for like 50 years. I've been around it my whole life. Michelle's exactly right. When you're, when you're investing in a REIT, you have to know, okay, is that REIT invested in multifamily? Let's, t- let's talk about just cash flow in REIT that, that like either buys, you know, buys apartment buildings or is investor in apartment buildings. Then, you have to ask yourself the question or apartment buildings or whatever real estate you have to ask yourself is it industrial is it retail is it apartment buildings you need to know because each of those asset classes is different what type of apartment buildings is it class a b or c because class a typically in a market will get smoke checked in a down market and everyone will move from class a to b and c to save money even though it's real high end net worth that gets typically gets hit the hardest and you need to know that and then on the other side of the house if it's if it's mortgage REIT who will what is it is it houses if it's houses you better be really careful because people are paying overinflated prices so you're paying for the cash flows off of mortgages on houses if it's multifamily then what part of the country so there's a lot that goes see that the problem the problem that michelle and i run into you're going to do a lot of brain damage 
if you don't understand real estate inside out to figure it out, like it's, it's almost impossible because real estate is different from like say Oracle because the prices maintain the same pricing, but real estate is one of those industries. that's very market specific, very location based. So if one market you think is doing really well in your REIT and then the jobs just tank there, well then that hits your REIT 10, 20, 30%. Mm. So Michelle's wow. right. You're, you're like hunting for 5%. Mm-hmm. When the prudent thing to do is what she's pointing out is wait with your cash position. This is not financial advice. We're just our, what we would do is wait with your cash position and, and then buy great companies. And if you can't wait, then, then spend the time building your own company. You can get 5% of your money. Go sell a product on Amazon or find something. Just test the waters and make your own 5%. That would be my advice. Yeah. And, and I've heard there are plenty of freelance kinds of websites. If if you've got plenty of time and you want to just earn some cash on the side, I mean, I'm not necessarily saying that people should go out and do this, but if you're interested, like I've heard sites like Fiverr exist, or I'm sure there's many others that you can freelance your time and earn some money that way. Like it, and And like Werner said, one of the best ways is to either start your own business or invest in yourself. And I, I'm hoping that I'm doing that by investing my time in my YouTube channel. I'm hoping that that pays dividends down the line. So I'm, you know, putting in the hard work now, you know, um, not necessarily seeing the immediate returns from something like that. And what it requires is that you have patience. Like you need to have some idea of, of when you're going into starting your own business, that it's something that you feel competent in and that it will hold your interest. Like if you if you just sell something on Amazon or eBay for a couple of months and then you give up, that won't be a sustainable way to, to run a business. So it needs to be something that you care about. Like I've, I've heard a lot of people had great success with detailing cars. Like people have yeah. really good cash flows coming from just cleaning yeah. cars, right? Yeah. So, so if you're really passionate about having a great looking car, maybe you can turn that into a way to generate cash flow. So all kinds of ways that people can make money as long as it's within their interest and they feel like they can commit to it long enough that they will see the fruits of their labor eventually. Because like, there's like some quote, I forgot if it's like Edison or something, but like so many people are so close to success up until the point that they, they felt like they were a failure. And so they give up when they think they're a failure, but they, if they would have just held on a little bit longer, they would have reached success. Yeah, that's see, that's that's a very good quote, and so to touch on that quote, but also going back to what you're saying about detail in business, from doing construction and real estate for seven or eight years, or the last ten years actually, I forget how long it is. I learned if you want to learn like how to do cost management, do a construction project. I mean, I've been in Lowe's, and there's thou I know Lowe's inside out. In the back now, different Lowe's are all organized, but the one in Mid City Los Angeles, I know really well. I know where different things are thousands of different parts you got to know the cost of those parts are people are people employing those parts correctly are they stealing parts i mean there's just a whole host of things so if you look at a detailing business like michelle said well, what would that entail let's just break that down for a second you could take let's say you have 100 grand saved up well you could go buy a van right like a little ford ford um, i forget what they're called but a little van You'd buy a little water container with a pump, a high pressure pressure sprayer. You'd buy some soap. You'd buy your detail equipment. Figure out what all those costs are. But she's right; those businesses are high because I I watch those businesses. I'm getting my truck worked on right now, and I saw a guy show up at this place called Go Big Trucks, where I'm getting my truck worked on in Ventura. And this guy showed up, and he had a really nice setup. Everything was clean, and he was detailing this guy's um, this guy who owns the shop. And I won't say how much business they do a month but they do you know they do a bunch let's just say they do a lot mm. they have like 40 or 50 people a month coming in and out those doors doing oh, yeah. a, a lot of i mean he's doing really well and mm-hmm. the detailer shows up and it's like man you got yourself you do a good job you got yourself piped in with 40 or 50 guys coming through the door like that guy's doing marketing for you hey mm-hmm. you want to detail your car while, while you're here start thinking that way like michelle's saying because because here's the challenge. If you go to 5% for REITs, the challenge, which most people don't realize, since the Fed lowered their interest rates down to near zero, about zero, and because of inflation, people don't realize we're running a negative interest rate, you are mm-hmm. now way the hell out on the risk curve, mm-hmm. meaning you're taking 
way more risk to get that 5% when in the past you could have just owned a treasury, which paid more than that, which is no risk, but you're taking risk in a REIT, knowing like what type of real estate asset is it? Is it, I mean, it, real estate's not, a, it's a simple business, but it's hard to execute. Mm -hmm. So do you go 5% out on the risk curve, which could get you absolutely smoke checked? Or do you do what Michelle's saying, do something you love and, and build your own, like we said, invest in yourself, invest in your business and build something. Like she said, you get to the point where you're finally successful and then you, you start growing more cash flow that you can control and then you have your saved up cash flow and then when it all tanks, then you, you execute. We want, we want you guys, Michelle and I want you guys to start thinking that way, thinking yeah. smarter. We don't want you to take on a lot of risk. We want you to put your money, like I said before, in a position where you're going to get guaranteed cash flow and it's going to be the lowest amount of risk as possible. Right. And, and it, it can be tough. I mean, like right now it, it looks like, you know, you, you could have invested in the S and P 500 these last three years and seen like, you know, double digit, like high 15, 20, almost 30% returns each year for the last three years. So arguably you could have doubled your money just in the past three years. And, and I mean, that that's great, but you got to ask yourself, how likely is that to continue this way? And then also, um, you know, do you find yourself buying at the top? Like the one thing that I, I keep asking myself is like, I don't want to end up being the greater fool because you you keep relying on the greater fool buying from you as the next person to buy at ever higher prices. And, and just... You know, you got to ask, when will that end? Like, when will the good times per se stop? Because it's just it with a price to earning Schiller earn uh, cape ratio of like almost 40. I know it's come probably down a little bit from there, but that's at 40 when historically, you know, it'd be at like 15 or 16 PE. And so if you're buying stocks now at the average S&P 500 PE of 40, you're expecting two and a half percent returns. Like, is that really what you want when... You could be putting that in, in like a treasury that's almost up, almost as much of a return as that much. Not quite. It's a little bit still a ways, but you know, how much more risk are you willing to take on right now where we are in the market based on a lot of indicators? And, and there's so many indicators that show we're starting to top out. You know, we've got a lot of famous people warning about investing against just index funds right now. And, and they can be good. Like they've been great for a lot of people over the last decade, but how much more room is there to really run in them? So I'm not trying to say get out of your index funds if you're in them, but, but just be careful and be mindful about what are you actually invested in and what is it likely for it to continue going the way it has been? Because a lot of Wall Street has projected that returns for 2022 could only be on average like 4%. Like some are still really bullish, like 10% returns, and some are really bearish, like like more than 6% of a decline. And and so you just have to weigh the odds of where, where you think things are going to be. And also ask yourself, how are you going to feel if the market were to tank 35%, 50%, what would you do? Like, would you be panic selling or would you, would you want to keep buying the dip or, you know, like think, think now while things are still calm before, you know, we're in panic emergency mode and, and a lot of things are flying. And then you're, you're kind of like, like mentally you're stressed and you're trying to make a decision, but you're emotionally affected by what we're seeing. Like we see our you know, balances in our portfolio and it looks red, like everything is like a sea of red. And that can naturally make a lot of people feel unnerved. So you like while times are good, what I'm trying to do is keep researching and learning and also come up with prices that I would want to pay for something. So like, let's say I want to pay 50% off whatever something's selling for right now. If it's at $400, then I have a little list saying I'm going to buy that security when it hits $200. So that, for example, is my game plan. So it it makes me feel like I have some sense of control over my future. I'm not just lending it up to chance because I have a game plan. Like I did my homework. I think that buying something at at that price makes sense based on future cash flows at higher interest rates, let's say. Like so, you know, whatever projections that I'm doing in my spreadsheets, that's kind of what I'm guessing could happen. And what are the likelihood of 
companies continuing to produce cash flows at certain percentages based on their long-term historical averages. Because even if they've even if they've done 20, 30 percent cash flows in the last couple of years, is that likely to continue? Or or do we think they'll come back down to more like realistic levels, like 10 to 15 percent sometimes? So um, that's just something to just weigh and think about. Yeah, so you touched on three really important things, and they point to two core areas. You talked about mindset mm-hmm. and then the financial performance of the stock. So in mindset, and a lot of people, my friend Mario, who we did another, it, it, it did never upload it because of the software it just had a glitch. Right. Sorry. But no big deal, guys. We're, we're doing it again for you. So Mario talked about, and I learned this. I used to do Muay Thai fighting. It's a really brutal sport. I had to stop because I was getting hit in the head so much. It was, mm. It's just, it's a very frontal, like boxing, you can kind of get out of the way. But Muay Thai is because it's kicking, it's, it's uh, Thai uh, boxing. So kicks, knees, elbows, all that stuff. And what I found was, is when you're in a fight, you're sparring with someone, the more crazy you get, that may work on on like a novice opponent, but on a guy that's a really good fighter, he'll just sit there and watch you and wait till you're like fighting. You drop like this. Like one, one guy gives, he's a semi-pro fighter, small Asian guy, like 150 pounds named Leo. I dropped my hand like this and his foot was in my face. Oh, wow. And he's like, keep your hand up. I was like, and he was a coach. I was like, yes, coach, I got it. Oh, wow. <laughs> my point is, is when you're in an environment, like Michelle's saying, at the bottom of the market, the last thing you want to do is be all fritzed out and crazy because you're not going to be able to see the angles. And this is something that Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, they, they talk about it a little bit, but they're very, if you've noticed old school investors, they're very cryptic with their knowledge. Mm-hmm. This new YouTube age with me and Michelle, we give it to you straight how it is. <laughs> old guys like Warren Buffett are like, no, nah, cryptocurrency is, is junk. But what they're really saying is, no, we're waiting patiently. Whenever, and they've talked about when everyone's freaking out, we're going to be calm. We're going to be executing when the market's going crazy. So Michelle's saying your mindset is the most essential aspect. You're not going to be able to make clear, calculated decisions if you're in fight or flight. You're seeing everything going red, red, mm-hmm. red, red. Mm-hmm. That's, so that's a key aspect. So this is why you wait. And if you're at the top, wherever you think the top is, you sell. And you, as Michelle says, you're always analyzing the second part performance I always look at it this way as Michelle saying, same exact thing. Can where where's I have a group of money here, whether it's equity in the business or it's just right, the equity in the business. Can I take this money off the table and make a certain percentage more later on? I'm constantly analyzing that. And then also analyzing, like she said, stress testing the business. Which way, like if you look at a 10K of any businesses, if you've never wrote one, guys, go look at one. But in the beginning, what do they do? They tell you about all the risks. They literally delineate them out. This could happen with the company. This could happen with the company. And that's what Michelle's talking about. So mindset is essential. Understanding, a, a, so the second thing is stress testing to see, well, where could this business possibly go? And the number three she talked about is financial benchmarks. What's your financial benchmark? Like what percentage are you willing, like if I give you my cash, what percentage do you want to return? Uh, what percentage and what is my strike price? Taking the cash flow margin, taking all the shares, dividing the cash flow by the shares to see a price. That's how I do it cash flow per mm-hmm. share, and then putting a multiple on it. Like she said, people don't realize 2%, guys, it's going to take you two to find 150 years, right? Mm-hmm. Is that right? 50, 50 years to make your money back. Yeah, that sound, sounds right. Two, two, Some of them 2%. Because you're. Hundred dollars, I think two dollars. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, if you reinvest it, it'll go quicker. But let's just say straight line, fifty. That's what you're paying. That's what people don't realize. You're paying for fifty years, and what you're being sidelined by is the fact that it's just appreciation, human behavior, human behavior. But if you don't get out in time, you don't lock that in, which most people in history don't do. Mm-hmm. You get smoked on the way down. Yeah. So I'd I'd rather be a fool on the way up and and have some cash on the side than then be fully invested right now. And uh, because I I don't know when it's going to all come tumbling down. And, and I don't know, you know, I wouldn't be able to get my uh, money out fast enough. And uh, Werner, you mentioned something like this to me too. Like when, when we're trying to sell our stocks in the process of doing that, if there's no buyer at the available amount of shares that you want to sell, 
then there will be a next bid down. And then maybe some, some of your order might get filled at the lower price until you finally get rid of all of your shares. And at that point you would have averaged way down on whatever your sell price was. So, so that's, um, you know, something that you also got to think about is if, if you don't have high conviction in your picks to survive through a recession, and if you're looking to get out of them before the bubble pops, I mean, that's also something to, to look into is, is what is your sell plan? Because that's also something that not some people don't believe in having a, a sell plan. Like some people don't really think about it too much. And you don't have to think about selling if you have high conviction and, and you plan to hold no matter what happens or you might cost average down. So maybe that helps. But, you know, it's just something to think about is what what steps are you going to take when, you know, stuff hits the fan? And that's that's an act sort of, um, what's the word, how, how the joints are made on dovetails into uh -huh. to what I was saying, which is basically, you know, if you buy a stock or to further say what Michelle's saying or further like sort of prove that point out, if you buy a stock, like say at the bottom of 2008, like Texas Instruments, and you're getting insane cash flow returns, then you might go like, hey, I may never get this stock at this price again. I'm not mm -hmm. willing to take that risk. But if you bought midway up the cycle, and you're like, yeah, I think it's going to go below that and I can get better returns. And this is all there's all, see, you got to think about this a lot because you're like, well, will the company continue to pay cash flow at the same rate? That's why like Michelle focuses on investing on my channel. I focus a little bit more on the other aspects, buying and building businesses, because you can control more of your destiny with your own company. But, the ch but with a big company, you can't get the reach or the mm -hmm. profit margins that so there's so it's all it's a constant game of thinking about I have a certain amount of cash where do I deploy it to get the best return on it that's this mm -hmm. investing and it's a constant it's not just fire and forget like Michelle saying it's like do I dollar cost average down because I want to sell 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 and then I think I'm gonna get a better deal at the bottom that's this investing game like where where can I take my chunk of energy and get the best return on it and that's not like we can't give you a steadfast. We can give you like set your financial benchmarks, do this, like do this multiple, look for this percentage. But you got to con it's a constant game of flux where you're thinking about where do I get the best? And it's like if great investors and businessmen and women, they're like Michelle, tell you, we're thinking about this all the time. I'm literally thinking about this all the time as soon as I get up. Yeah. I mean, I think about capital allocation a lot. And I mean, every day, I I mean, I don't know if this is too much overkill, but I look at my spreadsheets of of my assets and how they're doing. And even if I don't update them all the time, I try to see, I look at the cash and I look at the equities and I think, how are they performing and how would I like them to be performing? Like, what could I be doing differently to try to, you know, improve on how I did last year? Like, you know, a lot of people like to compare themselves to the benchmarks, but the way that I'm trying to invest, like I, I'd rather not compare myself to the stuff like S and P 500 benchmark because I'm not playing the same game. I'm not just investing in 500 companies. So I, like it's it's a totally different thing. Like I, it's like apples and oranges. Like if I'm buying a company that's been going down compared to uh, like the rest of the market when it's been flying up, like it's it's just a different mindset. So it's it's not, I don't think, correct to compare like, oh, you're down 20% compared to like the S&P 500 being up 28%. And that's just a hypothetical example, but it's just, you know, a different thing. And, and you have to think like, you know, based on your projections, based on what you've researched, like sure, in the, in the short term, you could be down, you know, like a lot of people have been down in the like short term, but then if they've invested correctly, they eventually get that money back, like, you know, by if, if there's enough cash flows that are coming through, like if you start your own business, like you're usually down because you, like we talked about that detailing business, you're, you're negative at first because you have to buy some of the equipment and cleaning products or you're maybe in the red at first. But then hopefully if you start generating cash flow after doing a few jobs, then you're in the black. So, you know, it's that kind of thing is like you weigh what you might be investing in now and and like 
not not to be phased by short term fluctuations in the market where you could be artificially down. Like that's like so one thing that so many people say to me is like, oh, what do you think about you know the market or oh my port my my stock portfolio is down today like X percent. And I feel like that all of that doesn't matter. Like that's just like talking about the weather. Like it's in the grand scheme of things, it's really not that big of a deal. Like it's it's really superficial when anyone is just asking, oh, what do you think about the market right now? Like it's it's immaterial. Like what what we should be focusing on is is what is the underlying business doing? Like how are they investing for their future? What where where do we think the market's gonna go if let's say something is growing their cloud database systems? Like, how do we think that's going to provide real economic value? Like, I know Buffett likes to talk about economic value that something is going to produce. So, like, think about something like that rather than, like, your portfolio being up or down a certain percentage. Yeah, that's so those, that's a really great point because how I look at it is, and not everyone looks at it the same way. Obviously, my channel is focused on cash flow. Your channel is focused on how Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger are doing it. And I have a question for you after this. but. So if you look, Warren Buffett's talked about this. If you look at the markets, if you're solely, and I don't know if he's solely, if, I, I would guess most of his portfolio is based on cash flowing businesses, right? That pay, pay him to own them. Is that well, I, I think um, a lot of them do. I mean, obviously Coke and Apple give dividends as well as like, he gets tons of premium. Like the, one of the biggest reasons of Berkshire success is Geico and a lot of their insurance businesses where they take a lot of the premiums coming in as cash flow to be able to invest that money. So, you know, as long as they do well, they're able to generate better returns than what they have to pay out in insurance claims. And that's one of the best ways that Warren Buffett has been able to benefit from this sort of leverage. Like it's not the kind of leverage where you're borrowing money for the, from the bank, but he's kind of borrowing money from the people who pay him car and house and other kinds of insurance through Geico and otherwise. So like, that's how Buffett does it. Like, I wish I could, you know, if I could get to that point of being able to take in premium through insurance based mechanisms, which there are some ways, like I'm, I'm aware of a few little ways to do that as a retail kind of person, but like, I'm not nearly anywhere on his level. So, but, but that's something, you know, that that's so, a great source of his success. So break that down. So is Buffett actually, cause I'm not really familiar with the insurance game is Buffett taking a cash flows off of these companies through his insurance he's actually getting cash flow in his coffers from his insurance plays or no yeah i mean i i think that's where a lot of cash is coming from like when you get the premium that you know people who buy insurance policies gave you and then take that premium money and invest it so he is it because he owns a majority of these companies now he's a he can like geico that. geico's fully owned by berkshire hathaway and they have a oh. number of they have a lot of insurers that are that belong to Berkshire. Oh, so he can act. So he can actually determine. He I can, didn't realize he can, that. He, he can allocate the capital that these insurance companies within Berkshire are per, throwing off. Like he he takes all the cash that all the I want to say like fifty or something subsidiary companies of Berkshire. So he takes the money from like I think they own Brooks Shoes. They take the money from Brooks Shoes, from Seas Candies, from you know Burlington Northern. Like they take all the money from all the cash that's coming out of these businesses and then invest it in more stuff or equities or whatever. And he doesn't. He doesn't he pay a dividend in. for Berkshire Hathaway stock. Oh no! They what? he he kind of jokes. That. He kind of jokes about like um, a mistake once. Like he said that one time maybe when he was in the bathroom, the board approved a ten cent dividend, and and ever since then he they've never done a dividend like since that. You know why? Kind of so mistake. let me ask you a question. Why is why is he, I'm just curious, is down a different road. Why is he not a guy as successful as him that understands? Because what people don't realize is Warren Buffett, I think he really didn't become as wealthy just owning stocks. He came wealthy owning businesses and be able to oh, control yeah. the cash flow. So why mm -hmm. is he not, if he knows that he owns these businesses and he's controlling the cash flows, why isn't he enriching the owners of his stock. I mean, he's enriched him through through appreciation of price, but why is he not doing it through consistent cash flows? Do you know why? Well, um, through dividends, not through dividends. Like, I mean, he's been doing some buybacks in the last couple of years, but but basically, it's it's a stock appreciation. I mean, this is why they've never um, 
they've never split the stock of Berkshire A shares. They like they just continues to stay at that massive amount. And he's totally content with that because what what his mindset is, he realized that he can better deploy the cash than giving it to retail investors. So imagine if like throughout most of Buffett's life, he was able to compound at at least 20 percent returns per year for at least like 50 or at least a really long time. And imagine like, can you and I compound our money at 20% per year? Like I'm not yet that good. I'm I, like, I'm, you might be, but I, I'm I not... can do it. I can do it. And I can do way above that in real estate, but real estate's a different animal because, uh-huh. because of the debt gain. You can't, mm. you can't, there's you have no leverage. Other, yeah. Leverage. You can't like, if you take, think about it, if you buy a building for a million, Mm-hmm. You get the cash flows off that million, mm-hmm. but you're only investing two hundred thousand. Yeah. You've just like five x your mm-hmm. cash flow. You can't do that in in any other asset. Well, you can do that if you buy the businesses Warren Buffett's doing, mm-hmm. and then you have initial investment. You keep growing it and growing it and growing it, but it takes the long term. Like yeah. the initial. So what I'm saying is the initial. If you want initial twenty, thirty, forty percent bump. Real estate's the best way to do it, but if mm. you're if you're in it for the long term, you can't beat the economics of an oracle like cash for cash real estate. Mm. It's only because of that leverage. But so this is this is something else we can talk about in the future. Yeah. But like, well, and, what, and my yeah, point is, so the the final point is because Buffett knows he can better allocate capital than giving it to retail investors. That's why he chooses to hold on to the capital. I mean, he's got at least $150 billion right now in straight up cash. Yeah. And I mean, that's a lot of, that's, that's like 15% of what all of Berkshire Hathaway might be worth right now. If you include the value of the company, as well as their equity portfolio, like, so 15% he's holding in just straight up cash. So, I mean, that's, that's pretty significant to me that someone as good as he is, is struggling to find good deals now. So let, you know, for anyone who thinks that, you're investing and you think it's so easy and you can get great returns. Some of the best of all time is not, you know, just making money hand over fist and, and getting new acquisitions or buying new businesses. It's, it's not super, you know, available to him right now. And he's probably parking a lot of that $150 billion in just short term treasury bonds. So he's content with getting like one to one and a half percent. Like he's, He's not even playing that much. I mean, maybe some of it he can play in options, but I'm not sure how much options he's doing. So this is a great point because this points to what what I've been talking about before, three ways or four ways to invest your time and money. Building a business. And I didn't really I didn't I don't really I understand Warren Buffett's approach, like because I've read some of the securities analysis by Benjamin Graham, but I didn't realize to the extent that you're sharing me how he's really doing it. So what he's really doing, he's not investing, he's buying businesses. Maybe he's investing, he's investing some bit like startups. I think a solar business went south. Mm. But so the difference between Warren Buffett is see, this is this is a caveat, guys, because this is a very unique situation in the investment world. Most of the time the business you're investing in, 99% are not doing this. So what we were talking about before is you're investing for cash flow and you're gonna hold that cash flow. And we can talk about this later on, but you're gonna you're gonna invest in a business at the bottom of the market, get the cash flow, keep stacking it and stacking it and stacking it until you can buy a better business or invest in a better business. Warren Buffett is is actually buying the business. Mm-hmm. He's not investing. He's he's invested. It's a form of investment, but he's actually buying the whole business. Yeah. And when you can buy a business and you control it, you'll become much wealthier because you control the cash flows. You can pay yourself mm-hmm. however much you want. When you invest mm-hmm. in a business, it's more on the passive end. Warren Buffett's a little bit more on the active end. Mm-hmm. Going to a job is more active cash flow, like you're generating for your own human potential. This is fascinating. So guys, just realize when you invest in Warren Buffett's company, you're investing in a company that buys businesses whole, controls them, and then and then enriches the share price. What we were talking about before is you're investing in single businesses that are cash generators, and you're waiting for them to buy them at the bottom of the market. This is Yeah, this is really... This is really a deep dive. So hope, hopefully, aren't losing some people <laughs> on some of this, but it's fascinating. It's, this is this is the way you guys want to think about like: Are you buying a business? Are you building it? Because we're all doing this, especially technology. Mm-hmm. There's no better time. Like Michelle starting a business, I'm starting a business in YouTube. Her performance, like I'm at five followers, she's at a thousand. So her performance, she's a much better business than me right now on YouTube. That's just that's just the facts, right? It's just how it is. 
right? So, well, thanks. yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's, I mean, see, but we're starting businesses. We're, I mean, they're they're not necessarily making money. Maybe you're making money right now off YouTube, but when they do, we're we're putting in, like she said, we're putting in the groundwork to make money later. We're putting in our human potential. I'm investing some camera equipment. She's investing her time in certain things. But this is what you guys want to understand, guys, is like, I'm going to invest my time, my money somewhere. What's my return? Yeah. And and one of the ways, like, you know, if, if you're not necessarily wanting to straight up start a business directly is like some ways that some people have done really well is if they've joined, this might be a little bit on the riskier end, but if you join a company that's a startup and if they give you partial equity in their company, like, let's say you you work there for some years and then you get vested options and then you can um, buy those options to get shares in the company. And it could work out for some people, like some people who were in the early days of Lululemon were able to get a good amount of stock options and then that became worth like over a million dollars. So, you know, not saying that this is necessarily going to happen to every startup because we know there's a high fail rate with startups. But if you believe in what a company's doing and if you're getting some salary, like I wouldn't necessarily just get 100% stock options, yeah, but maybe get key. maybe get some stock options in addition to a livable salary. And, and then if you can get some stock options and, and if it works out, that's kind of like hitting a little lottery in a way. Like you, if that company did well, went public, like you know, you could be hitting the jackpot for some people who were fortunate enough to join some companies in the early days before they IPO'd, like it could, it could do really well for some people. So that's another option just to keep in the back of your mind of potential ways that you could be, you know, adding or stacking the odds in your favor. Like how can you be allocating your time that it's more likely to yield dividends down the road. And and rather than just consume and, you know, watch TV on the couch, like instead of being a couch potato where you generate zero returns by watching TV, you generate, yeah, yeah you generate some returns by investing your time or working for somewhere that, that you can kind of envision where they're going to be. And maybe you also participate in a stock investment program from a company. So if your company offers you a discount, like even five to 10% of a discount to buy their shares, and you believe that it's a good price, then maybe you also invest directly in the shares of the company you work at. And that could also be a really great way. Like I was able to do that when I was just a teenager working at Starbucks and I bought some stock that I still have. And I mean, my cost basis has already been paid off a long time ago with the dividends I got from Starbucks. So it's like, you know, it's like free money now, just holding on to that stock. I mean, I, I never need to sell it. And it just gives me cash every year, every quarter. And so. here's a, that's an excellent point of what you're saying. And it kind of points to what I was saying before. And I just briefly touched on it. So I don't know if you guys really got it, but you have time and effort, right? And that time and effort creates money. So as the older you get, I would focus, I would figure out your percentage. 95% of my time or 95% of my money goes into cash flowing business. So if it's 95% of my time, what I mean by that is I'm going to go to a company that for 95% of my time, they're paying me and then 5% calculate that. Maybe when you're younger, 20, 21, maybe you're willing to do 50, 50. Right. But just think about because I struggled with this when I got in the military. Should I just do full startup? Should I make money? This is what you really want to figure out is what percentage of your time is going towards cash flow, whether you're working for a business and cash is flowing into you, say 95%. And then you say, well, I'll take 5%. Calculate your time, calculate what your time's worth, and then put a value on, okay, you're giving me this many stock options. What's that value at in my time? And what percentage is that? And do that with your money. 95% will go to only cash flowing businesses. And what percentage will go to speculative businesses that don't make cash? Uh, Warren Buffett's kind of different one because I I mean, you're not you're not making money. I'll touch on that another time, but just kind of figure that out, guys, because then you can you can know like, okay, I'm willing to go work for a startup when I'm younger and 50% of my time, if I work 40 hours a week, it's I want to get paid for 20, and then that rest that 20 value, that's how much stock I want. And I think that's a great way to give you like a benchmark and you set whatever percentage you want, but that's a great way to look at it. you. All, and you always want to get someone to pay. You. Here's why. If you don't get someone to pay you for your time in a startup, they're, they're not going to really respect your time. Uh, yeah, you could do an internship if you really want to get your foot in the door, but if you're going to do an internship, say, hey, listen, I'm willing to do an internship for six months, 
but I want payment after that six months. If they fire you and you're a phenomenal performer, then you know that company's full of crap. Right. Like get, get paid. Get paid for your. But what Michelle and I are saying is get paid for your, for what you're worth. People are afraid to ask. No, no, no. You. Everyone has a value. Get paid for that value, because the speculative bet is not always going to pay off. But the payment in your, in your. Um, account that will pay off by investing it. So Michelle, do you have any final, this is a phenomenal interview. I, uh, I, I've been having such great time learning from you too, Werner. And I'm really grateful to talk with you about all of these topics. I mean, it's so important and, and you've added a layer of insight and depth that I also haven't really thought nearly enough about on some of these topics. So I, I greatly appreciate that you shed all this light on everything and, um, you know, I, I also want to learn more from you, from what you're doing in your channel and how you're focusing on the cash flow businesses. And, and you know, that's something that successful people in general try to do. They expand their networks of other successful people and learn from them as to how that can help improve what we're doing. And maybe I can find a way to help Werner and contribute to what he's doing and help him be more successful because that's how you actually gain a lot of success in life is is that you don't only think about you know what can you get but what can you give and and try to see how far that can take someone else because the the irony is you know you if you give more the universe gives back to you in ways that you don't expect so like that that's something that I also want to keep in mind and and just try to be helpful to other people and give my time and whatever knowledge or insights that I'm able to be helpful with like it's great if that it can help someone and help them be more successful. Like I think the more that we try to have this positive feedback loop of helping other people and try to bring success, um, that can only be you know good for the world. So, like that's that's basically what I want to just um, end and say with is thank you so much, Werner, and I've learned so much from you, and I I hope to continue learning more from you as well. Yeah, thank you, and same here. I've learned a ton about Warren Buffett and. I mean, I had no idea really how he was. I mean, I had, had a. I know how he evaluates the businesses and his patience and waiting. But yeah, I learned a ton from you on this one also. And you made a great point that the reason why people want to connect together is because we all have blind spots. We can't see certain areas. Like there's certain things I know about investing and cash flow, and there's certain things that you know, Michelle, that I don't know. There's like there's a saying like, you know, you know what you know, you know what you don't know, and you know what you don't know that you don't know. That's mm -hmm. the hardest one. That's the blind spot. You oh, just yeah. don't even know it's there. Mm -hmm. And that's why we want to work together uh, as a network of people to build like this financial knowledge because it's important because right now you made a very good point. We want to help each other because there's a lot of people out there, and, you, and I didn't touch on this, but that are going to get absolutely smoke checked. I mean, they're, they're, they're going to, and if it reminds me of the tulip bulbs, like mm -hmm. there was like 12 Semper Augustus tulip bulbs and in the Dutch empire, one of the greatest financial empires ever than the British and our empire, these tulip bulbs, like 14 or 15 of them, they had so much money that now they were speculating the wealthiest were buying tulip bulbs. It reminds me of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. They're buying Bitcoin, but now people are like, ah, oh, Bitcoin's too expensive. So now I'm going to Ethereum. Now mm -hmm. I'm going to Dogecoin. Now I'm going to mm -hmm. Shibu Inu. Now mm -hmm. I'm going to like, um, I don't know, like Poodle Coin, whatever the next one is. So Shiba Elon. Yeah, Shiba Elon. I mean, it's just it's just the insanity is it reminds me of the tulip bulb. And what you start seeing is like in the Dutch tulip bulb, the the women that had these massive like metal loom machines that were expensive, they were leveraging them to go buy these like yellow and the lower level yellow and, and red tulip bulbs that were that were worth nothing. Mm. And you look at Bitcoin, I'm not saying I think smart contracts and blockchain and that's where the real value is, but like the Bitcoin valuation, it's just, it's, well, and you're right. So we need yeah. to band together to help people to see like, what are the fundamentals right. to support you in creating performance over 20 or 30 years? And, and, and just also think about some of what you mentioned is, is think about Bitcoin and some of these cryptos is like collectibles. Like they're, I, I, you know, I don't know. It, it, if this is just me, but I kind of see them as like any other collectible that like people put some attribute of value on it to some extent, like art or collectible cars or Pokemon cards. Like it's, it's kind of a collectible the way it is right now. Like there's some group of people that are putting a value on it for whatever it's worth at the moment and it's not producing cash flow. So what I'd be more interested in 
are companies that are using smart contracts and blockchain technology to produce cash flow? Like how can they use this amazing revolutionary technology and not just have it be like a non-cash producing collectible, but to actually be something that that can generate economic value that that somehow is productive and helps people and and you know people would actually want to pay for because it's a service that makes sense and makes life easier. So that's something that you know I think is a good way to think about it. That I'm still trying to figure out who who will figure out who will corner the blockchain. Who like who could it possibly be? I don't know if Jack Dorsey has it figured out with where he's going with Square. Who knows? But you know, I know that he's really into crypto, and and I'm I haven't done enough homework to know. Like this is still way outside of my circle of competence. And and to what you were saying about things that you don't know of of you know knowing what you don't know. Like this is exactly what circle of competence is all about. That Charlie and Warren have emphasized throughout time of. You know, you don't invest in things that you don't don't understand. So this is why I've never put my money in crypto yet or in REITs. I just don't understand them enough to to feel confident that whatever I'm going to put in there is actually going to still have value in the future. And that I know that it can lead to something greater and better because it's producing cash, because I don't know if it will produce cash. So that's the that's what I try to keep in mind. Yeah. So that's great points, Michelle. Pleasure. Thank you. You've thanked me. And guys, I want to thank you all for watching this interview. If you're not a follower, please follow. I'm at five. My goal is a thousand. My trendsetter is Michelle over here. And also I'll link her videos when she talked about uh, what she's seen on the, on the top of the markets. So I'll link her channel, follow her and her channel, Michelle Markey, Warren Buffett style investing, phenomenal channel. And as always like comment to get this message out to the world. And it's always a pleasure being with you guys. We really we greatly appreciate each other's company and anyone who's watching the video. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care.